Bending wood is easy, until it isn't. And bending it into purposeful design is a real challenge. In this video, I'll guide you through the process, sharing essential tips for success and common pitfalls to avoid, from bending forms to useful router tricks. I'll show you how to resaw flat boards and turn them into elegant curves. I also experiment with a cool LED cured finish, but will it live up to the hype? And you don't wanna miss the invisible custom hardware for these swing out drawers. It's a game changer. I started out designing this piece the old fashioned way, by hand and eye. I had an idea in my head for what I wanted it to look like, but mental visions don't always translate into artful and purposeful design. Right away I could tell that this curve was too sharp and these bends were too tight as well. It needed to be elongated to be more graceful. So after a quick back and forth with my buddy Paul and a few more iterations, this was the result. A beautiful sweeping curve with a lower and upper drawer that would each pivot open, somehow. But I'll worry about that later. First up were the templates for the bending forms. And seeing that I'm always looking for an excuse to crash my buddy Pete's shop, I employed his laser to cut the quarter inch MDF template, which when stood vertically looked suspiciously like a Kardashian. Uncanny, you might say. A quick touch up on the drum sander and it was back to my shop to start building the forms. Fortunately, I had a bunch of 5 8 inch Baltic birch cutoffs from a previous project and I started ripping that into strips. Now the construction of the curved shelf and the drawer fronts will be done with bent lamination. That is thin strips that are resawn from thicker material into thinner strips making them easier to bend and then glued back together. Now for the drawer fronts, I'm going to build a one-sided form and drill holes in the side for clamping. So by gluing up a couple of three-layered blanks and rough cutting them at the bandsaw and flush trimming them on the router table, I could then screw those together into a thicker form that would account for the width of my drawer front as well as an extra inch or so. But when it came to the curved shelf, well, that was going to be a much more involved process. Now onto the more difficult part, which is the bending form for our curved shelf. Now I wanna create a male and a female side so that I can clamp this whole thing together, which will squish our bent laminations together while they dry and create nice even pressure all the way around. But in order to do that, it's not as simple as just cutting out one side and then using the other side as the mating form. We actually need to take whatever the thickness of our bendy ply or our wiggle board here, which will line each side of the form, plus the thickness of our laminations and deduct that out of here so that our mating form fits exactly. If we were to just take this off cut and try to put these together, they wouldn't line up perfectly. So I've clamped the template to the plywood blank just so it doesn't move on me. And I'm just gonna quickly run a pencil line all the way around as a reference. Now I have this block that has one inch increment and I have another eighth inch spacer. So I'm going to put that up against the template. I can drop my pencil in here and now I can trace all the way around. And this is going to give me that perfect inch and an eighth distance that will account for our materials in between. So now we can start cutting these out. I'll use the jigsaw first, and then we can flush trim at the router table. Now both the male and the female side of the form are built the same, and then an interior skeleton construction. So I've screwed two pieces together here, so when they are cut and separated, the male and female will each have two side walls. Jerry, they're not gonna wanna be here for this one. And despite my warning, Shopcat Jerry just always wants to be part of the action. Well, until nap time, of course, and then it's up into the rafters he goes. I have no idea why it takes me so long to do things. Now to clean up the straight parts, I thought it was just easier to do on the table saw. Gave me a nice parallel cut with the bottom. And then with my template secured, I could start the flush trimming. This compression bit from Bits and Bits, wow. And with the template removed, you can see I now have two perfectly identical sides 
that now all need to be filled in with ribs or the skeleton to secure them. Now, since I didn't have a true template for the mating side of the form, after I cut it with the jigsaw, then I use the little belt sander here to fine tune it up to my cut line. Then that becomes my template, which I could screw to another piece of plywood and flush trim over at the router table as well. Now you may be asking, well, why didn't you just make the mating template on the laser when you were cutting the other one? Well, at the time, I didn't know what thickness of wiggle board I would be able to get to line the forms. I was hoping to get a quarter inch, but they don't sell it. So I had to settle for 3 8 Now for the internal skeleton to secure these forms together, I totally misunderestimated how much material I was going to need. And I basically went through all of my supply. And to make matters worse, things were not going my way. Now when it comes to building a form like this, I'm not sure there are any rules that govern how far apart the ribs should be, but I always lean towards more than less. Large gaps could create slight depressions when clamping, but that would probably only happen in a vac bag, not necessarily doing it this way. But having more ribs also increases the amount of contact points that I can staple down the wiggle board. Because even though wiggle board is flexible, the thickness of it will determine the radius that it will be able to bend around. For the 3 8 thick material that I will be using, that is about seven inches which should just barely work for this application. Using CA glue on those ribs gets them in place quickly and securely, and then I can come back with PVA glue and nails to permanently secure the outer walls. And there you have it, a roller coaster. Now I did test the wiggle board around the template, but now that I had the full form made, I just wanted to make sure. That yeah, looks like it'll go. Now, in my experience, when stapling and gluing wiggle board like this to a form, it tends to want to walk on you and you don't even realize it until you're halfway down and it's crooked. So by securing those blocks on the back side, it helps to keep everything in registration as I go. Now, I'm using staples to secure the wiggle board down to the form because they have much more holding power than regular brad nails. And the glue firmly locks everything together, making this one giant mass of wooden bending power. Now the wiggle board was a little wider than my form, so once everything was secure, I could just hit it with a flush trim bit and make it flush. The other side of the form went together exactly the same way, rinse and repeat, at which point Jerry came down from his nap. And then I removed a splinter. All right, there's still a little prep work left to do on these forms, but for now, I want to install these guide rails. And what these are is this allows, as we clamp these two giant forms together, it prevents any misalignment. Because there's going to be thin strips in here and epoxy and everything's going to be slippery, this could have the tendency to move left, right, and not be perfectly in place where we want it to be. So by installing these guide rails, we'll attach two on this form and one on this form. So that will allow perfect registration of both forms coming together when we clamp it. And using a large square ensures that everything is perfectly square with this edge. You don't want these out at an angle like this or they'll never go together. Now it was time to resaw. And to make sure all my strips go back in the same order, I draw this little reference triangle on the end grain and then start ripping. Now I've recently discovered a new blade for resawing, which I absolutely love. It's sold through Carter Products and it's called the Greenwood Blade. Yes, it's for green wood, but it's also for dried wood. I'll put a link in the description below for the exact blade that I'm using and where I bought it. Now my process for resawing is pretty simple. I make my first cut and then I take that rough edge off the bandsaw, run it through the thickness planer to get it smooth again, and then that becomes my reference face on the fence again. I have my fence set to just about one eighth of an inch. Now I also have my bandsaw set up using the Alex Snodgrass method for resawing, which when done correctly, you should get no drift on your bandsaw. Ooh, 
That took a while to do two boards. Just about an hour. Now the moment of truth. Will it bend? No. Gonna have to go thinner. Now the drum sander can be a very slow process. And I went through several thickness tests until I finally got down to that magic thickness of 3 64ths of an inch or 1.3 millimeters for you metric people. That's thin, but these are tight radii. And to ensure there was no cracking, I had to go that thin. And then the drum sanding marathon began. A drum sander is not a thicknesser, so it's very light passes at a very slow speed. Now I didn't know if this would happen or not, but there was potential for all of those staple dimples to somehow telegraph through to my finished laminations. So I slathered up each side of the form with some peanut butter, let it dry, sanded it, and then lined everything with tape. This ensures that any epoxy squeeze out will not stick to the form and your bent lamination will easily pop off. So what I failed to take into account was the thickness of this tape. So now these rails, don't quite fit in there, so they're ne definitely not going to slide together easily. So I'm going to take off the outer rails, move them over slightly, and we should be good to go. So, it's always something. All right, so I'm just gonna wax these rails up a little bit to hopefully facilitate some smoother movement, if you know what I mean. So just a little paste wax. That's better. Then it was time to steam all of our strips. Even though these strips are very thin and they look bendy, when you squeeze them all together, they don't wanna bend uniformly. So we're gonna put them in the steam box, introduce a little heat and a little moisture. It will make them much more pliable. And then we'll put them in the bending form. We'll leave them in there for about an hour, which basically lets the wood know, hey, you're going to be bent this way, so get used to it. Then we can pull them out, let them dry, and then start spreading our adhesive. But some things to note here, when you are working with a steam box and you open it, it is very hot steam. So wear gloves, don't put your face in front of it. Now the other thing I've done here with all of my lamination strips is I have redrawn a registration mark right in the center. Because if I start pulling these boards out and stacking them up and they're in the wrong order, when I go to glue them up, it's going to be a problem. See? Steamies. All right, we're gonna set the timer for one minute. That should be plenty. We wanna make sure we pull them out in the same orientation and stack them the same way. I've also put a corresponding center line on the form that matches the center line on these pieces. Keep everything registered. So this is the piece of material that I'm going to use to face the drawer fronts. It's actually an off cut from a slab I used on another project, but it's got some pretty wild grain here. So my buddy Paul at Copper Pig showed me this little trick, basically creating a window the same dimensions as the drawer front as it wraps around. And so I can place this on here and see which section of the grain works best on the drawer front rather than just cutting it and realizing I made a mistake and I wish I had cut it another way. And then it was more resawing. These were a little easier because they weren't as tall as the shelf parts, but it was the same process. Rip, plane, rip, plane, and you end up with a lovely deck of walnut. 
with many functions, especially in a warm shop. Uh-oh. That's not going to make it. Back to the drum sander. These narrow pieces are easy to go three abreast through the machine, though. And now they bend relatively easily around this form. So I'm not going to steam these like the others. I'm just going to drill some holes in here for some clamps, and then we'll clamp it right to the form. Hopefully it works. I laid out these holes as close as possible to utilize as many clamps as possible when squeezing this lamination together. And I did have to lay these out on both sides of the form because my Forstner bit wasn't long enough to go through that thick of a material. So that was an added bonus. Now you have a few adhesive options when doing bent laminations. Total boat, baby. I'm going to use Total Boat Epoxy. You don't want to use yellow PVA glue here because you want a hard setting glue. Standard PVA glue is just a little too soft. So either epoxy, a plastic resin glue, or I've also used Gorilla Polyurethane glue. A lot of people don't like to use it because they overuse it and it gets very messy when it foams up. So whether I'm using epoxy or polyurethane glue, a foam roller does a great job distributing a perfect and even film thickness on the surface of your strips. Now to prevent my stack from sliding all around when I try to clamp it up, I'm just going to use some painter's tape here and secure the bundle together. An important tip when gluing up laminations like this, you want to start on one end and make your way all the way down to the other end. This will push that wave of adhesive down the line as you clamp it and squeeze out the excess at the end. If you squeeze the middle and the two ends and work your way in, you're going to end up with bubbles of adhesive and gaps between your laminations because there's no way for that adhesive to escape. All right, with the little drawer front in the form, I called in reinforcements for the shelf. You remember Pete Kardashian, don't you? Now, I'm not gonna lie, even though I had all these strips marked out, it still got a little confusing because what looks like right side up is upside down on the form, and by turning it one way or the other, it could be the front or the back or the top or the bottom. But ultimately, we got all the strips organized in the correct order and got plenty of epoxy rolled on. Now, I didn't see any need to apply to both sides of the strips. I felt a thick layer on one side was more than adequate. And to keep the strips aligned on the end, we just screwed on some clamps temporarily until we could start getting the form clamped up. And even with the open time that the epoxy affords you, the whole process is still stressful because at some point that epoxy starts to kick. And if things aren't coming together right, well, you're kind of f***ed. Now whack a mole on a little block here helps keep those laminations as even as possible in case any of them kind of squeezed up during the clamping process. And just to make sure that all the strips came together on the bottom where we couldn't see them, we flipped everything up, examined the undercarriage, and gave it the stamp of approval. Now with the clamps, the bending forms, and the strips, any guesses on how much this weighed? I did weigh it, so I do know. All right, the next day I could get the first drawer front out of the clamps and see how that looked. Yeah, that not steaming thing, it bit me. But more on that later. Let's get the curved shelf out of the form and see how that looks. Upon first glance, things look good. Ooh, cracked away from the form, no problem. This is always a nerve wracking moment for me when doing a bent lamination. You do all the things right, at least you think you do, and then you pull it out of the form and it looks good. Well, it looks good now. Well, as long as we don't get any shrinkage after the fact, we should be good. Okay, so I am really surprised here. I didn't get any spring back on the shelf itself, but on this little drawer front, you can see right there, it's about 3 16th of an inch. So it could be because I didn't pre-steam and pre-bend these. So what I'm going to do with the other drawer front is I'm going to steam it and pre-bend it, and I'm probably going to have enough material to make another drawer front to try to get this better. So I did steam and pre-bend these strips for the second drawer front. Now we'll glue these up and we should be good. Man, it really feels like Groundhog Day with all this clamping and unclamping. Now to clean up one edge on the drawer fronts, I'm just doing that on the jointer very gingerly, very carefully. But for the shelf, I decided to use one of the bending forms 
double stick tape it down and then run it through the bandsaw. Got that all trimmed up. And then I made this little jig. It's just a piece of plywood with some blocks securing it in place so I can run it through the thickness planer to get a parallel face and clean up all the edges on that side. It actually worked really well, as you can see. Nice and smooth, no gaps. Those laminations look great. Now on a project like this curved shelf that I'm building, on the surface it may seem pretty simple, but it's actually very complex starting way back from the design and sketching phase all the way through figuring out exactly how I'm going to build it, the materials, parts, and the steps needed in order to get it done most efficiently. But many times I have difficulty keeping all of those things organized in one central location. But that's where Milanote comes in. Milanote is a free tool for organizing your projects that is efficient and easily editable. The first step is to create a new board for your current project, which is as simple as drag and drop. Then a quick click brings up Milanote's huge selection of built-in templates in various categories for you to choose from. I went with the craft project template, which had all the elements I was looking for to organize this project. And since everything is super easy to edit and move around, after only a few minutes of entering some details, photos, and customizing the template, I had everything neatly organized organized on my board. The various tools and customization options let you be creative and colorful as you want and really add your personality to your boards. And here's the finished board organized into easy to read columns. With inspiration photos separated into two mood boards, this one for the curved shelf and this one for the drawers. This is much more efficient than scrolling through my phone trying to find a photo that I screen grabbed a month ago. Milanote also has a built-in web clipper that you can grab images from the web and quickly save them to your boards. And once they're in your board, you can drag and drop them wherever you want. Now I've also added my 3D design files into another column, which keeps my CAD files and renderings easily accessible. And the mobile app is incredibly handy when I'm out buying materials. I can easily check items off the list as I pick them up and it will update everything in real time. In previous videos, I've mentioned the importance of getting feedback from people in your trusted circle. With Milanote, you can collaborate with others in real time and get comments and feedback to refine your designs and share ideas. Or if you're working late, you can get notifications when people are back online and have made comments or suggestions to your boards. And right now you can sign up with Milanote for free with no time limit using the link in the description below and start organizing your projects like I have. Thanks so much to Milanote for sponsoring this video. Okay, we had a little more steaming to do. I put Lola in charge of monitoring the condensation bowl. And rather than put these in the form, I decided to experiment a little bit and over bend them. Just stick them in the clamp here so they don't move. Lola, you watch those. All right, you're sleeping. Jerry, you, nope, you're sleeping too. So if you ever run into a situation like this where you get some spring back, all is not lost. This pencil mark here is actually the trim mark for this drawer front that will align there. And if I line this up with an eighth inch reveal there, parallel to the front edge of the shelf, and just put in a little temporary back here that is also parallel with the back. There's a minor gap here, maybe one and a half, two degrees. So the way to save that is to actually cut that angle on this back. This would still be a 90. And then since the shelf is going to be cut to match this radius, I could just trace that on here, cut it, and no one would ever notice. So I didn't get any spring back on drawer number two. This is drawer front number three that I overbent. So let's see if we get any spring back on this one. Absolutely none. Now to trim up the edge on these drawer fronts, I opted for the table saw. I'm very confident in this method using a feather board and I feel very comfortable doing it. If you don't, then the jointer or the bandsaw might be the safer method. Just to show you why it's usually better to make a male and a female bending form or at least make curved clamping blocks. You can see the flat spot here and a flat spot here and here from the clamping blocks with all that clamping pressure. Because these strips were so thin, they just compressed. Now I'll be able to clean this up with a card scraper and some sanding, but the amount of time it's going to take me to do that, I probably could have made the other half of the bending form. And so the card scraping began, first to get off any squeeze out epoxy, and then to smooth out all those flat spots. 
But in the end, boy was it worth it to watch that grain pop. Now the width of my drawer needs to be 10 inches from this edge. So I'm going to put a square there. And now with another ruler, I can butt up to this edge and mark 10 inches. And that will be my cut line for this side. Now I've found the best way to make these cuts is using a crosscut sled. And while I did the drawer fronts, I did one side of the curved shelf at the same time. Okay, so this was completely unintentional, but I believe because of the panic we were in when I was trying to get this into the mold, it was a little bit off center, which made this straight section shorter than this. But we're going to turn that into a design aesthetic or to our design advantage. So on this side, the drawer will be a little bit smaller. And as this curves up and this drawer is elevated, this gets a little bit longer. So this will be a bigger drawer. Yes, it will be asymmetrical. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think I'm going to like the way this looks a little bit better. So I'll get this marked out and cut, and then we can start working on the drawer box construction. Now the easiest way I could think to square off the other end of the shelf was to use the track saw while it was in the form. Because of where the bend was, I couldn't actually get it to lay flat on the crosscut sled like the drawer fronts. And I figured this was as good a time as any to clean up all the epoxy squeeze out on the floating shelf using a series and a combination of card scrapers, which were great in this application, as well as a piece of foam that I affixed a piece of sandpaper to. So trimming the ends of the shelves to match the radius of the drawer fronts was a little tricky because I wanted a 3 16 of an inch overhang of the shelf, which meant the radius was a little bit different than the drawer front itself. So I started by tracing the drawer front on the shelf and then tracing them onto what will be my new template. Now, since the right and the left are a little different, I need to make them separately. Now this line I've drawn isn't my template. It's 3 16 of an inch smaller than what I want my template to be. So the question is, how am I going to make a new template that is 3 16 of an inch larger? Well, check this out. Okay, what I have here is a quarter inch bit inside a 5 8 of an inch bushing. Since we need a 3 16 offset from the template that we just made, the way the math works here is the 5 8 bushing minus a quarter is 3 8 of an inch. When you cut that in half, because this is centered equally, that's 3 16 offset on each side or all the way around. So by running that bushing on this template while we go around our shelf, it will give us a perfect 3 16 offset from the line that we drew for our curved drawer. I trimmed the majority of the waste off using the jigsaw, and then I could clamp my template in place and start flush trimming. A quick touch up with some sandpaper and we're smooth as silk. And then it was rinse and repeat for the other side. The sides and the backs of the drawer boxes were cut on the table saw, and then things got a little spicy, even for me. Now to cut the groove to accept the drawer bottom in the curved front, the back, and the sides, I used a slot cutting bit on the router table. Now why is this spicy, you might ask? Well, you have to do a plunge cut and a stop cut, because otherwise that groove will show on the end of the drawer parts. And not only do you have to do it once, my bottom is one quarter of an inch thick, and the slot cutting bit is only one eighth of an inch. So I had to make two passes stacked on top of each other. Now for the straight pieces, the stop cuts weren't a big deal. I could just set up a stop block, run my piece through, and as soon as it hit it, I knew to stop and the groove wouldn't go all the way through the piece. So I did my first pass on all my parts, raised the bit, and did my second pass, and did a test fit. Now I really wanted to use domino joinery on these drawer boxes. However, I needed to use four millimeter dominoes, but I didn't have any. And the thought of trying to balance the workpiece and the domino and plunging into those curved sides made me a little uneasy. So I went with dowel joinery. This is actually the new Jessam Tool doweling jig that produces one quarter inch holes. My only gripe with jigs like this is trying to balance the pieces and the jig and get a clamp on there to keep everything tight. It becomes one of those I need a third hand situations. Oh yeah, and if you don't have any dowels laying around, you have to make your own, which is actually quite easy using this DFM Tools dowel plate. 
So I just quickly make my way through the dowel sizes until I get down to a quarter of an inch and I have my own custom walnut dowels. So this is a new finish I am trying. This is cured with LED light. It is a hard wax oil. This is Heidelberg Pro Lignum Semi-Gloss. It takes a very powerful LED light to cure it. This was all provided by LED Coating Solutions for me to try out. So I'm pre-finishing the insides of these drawers. I think it'll make it a lot easier. I'm just gonna put some of the oil on here and work it in. Now this is actually my first project with this, so I am not an expert, I am a beginner. I've masked off here where my glue joints are as well. Now since this finish is only cured with LED light or the UVA rays from the sun, if you leave a wet drop on your bench, it will remain a wet drop on your bench. So now I'm just going to lightly wipe off the excess. And this by no means is a tutorial on how to use this finish. I am a newbie. So I'm going to give this a light sanding. It is a little rough after that first coat. Put a second coat on and then we can glue up the drawers. All right, so I'm gonna slide the bottom panel in here first. No glue. I want this to be able to float and expand and contract. Now you might be saying, boy, you really should have hand cut some dovetails for these little drawer boxes. And yes, it probably would have looked better. But since this is really a prototype and there are other things I wanna change about the design, I didn't feel that putting in all that extra time to hand cut half blind dovetails was worth the effort. And while those were drying, I made a little field trip down to my buddy Ryan's shop at Liquid Metalworks, where he was kind enough to cut these mounting brackets for the drawers out of 3 16 of an inch thick steel. And not only did he cut them, but he countersunk all the mounting holes and tapped the threads for the drawer pivoting mechanism, which he also helped me design, which I can't wait to show you. In order to prevent the drawer from hitting the wall when it's pivoted open, it needed to be set back from the back edge about an eighth of an inch. And the location of that pivot point in the mounting bracket was critical in the operation of this drawer. Luckily, with SketchUp, it's pretty easy to figure out that exact pivot point where it won't hit the wall. It only took a few minutes to move this thing around and get the exact location of where that pivot point and the mounting bracket needed to be. As you can see, it's just clearing the wall. And I can't stress enough how critical layout is with this, because if you're off just a 16th of an inch, it could hit the wall. Now the next challenge was making the mortise for the mounting bracket to be recessed into. For that, I turned to the Shaper Origin and Shaper Plate. I was able to design the file in Shaper Studio, download it to the machine, place it exactly where I needed it to be, and start cutting. As you can see, it was a bit of a precarious setup, having the curved shelf clamped to my bench and plate screwed down to the bench, but you can't argue with the results. Now at this point, you may have noticed a major flub in my construction of this shelf. I'm not gonna say what it is, but leave a comment below if you figure it out. I still can't believe it. Okay, let's go over this drawer hinge pivot mechanism real quick. Now this was the brainchild of my buddy Ryan down at Liquid Metalworks. These are all parts you can get at McMaster Car. It's a brass shoulder bolt, a bronze bushing with a flange. It's actually two of those. So the way this works is I cut a stepped hole in this piece here with the Shaper Origin. So there's a flange in this side and a flange with a bushing in this side. This bolt will come up through the bottom and attach to the mounting plate that we recessed in the underside of the shelf. Now to hide this bolt, I made another little block with a stepped hole from the same grain and the same piece that will cover that. And then this can sit in the corner of the drawer. Now there's an access hole in the bottom for the Allen key to turn this. So as this gets nice and tight and flush up against the plate, that will set our reveal from the bottom of the shelf to the top of the drawer. Definitely took me a while to get my head around this, but it's gonna be pretty darn cool. And to secure that end cap, if you want to call it, some CA glue was more than sufficient since two sides of this block will be glued into the sides of the drawer, making it rock solid. All that was left to do was to continue that radius I'd made on the top block all the way down, smooth it out, and then we could glue it into the drawer.
Okay, so a bit of a problem here. I have my nice even reveal where I want here. But if you can see on camera, it gets wider. We have almost 3 16ths of an inch here. What happened with this shelf, I didn't think I had any spring back, but I did. So what happened is it went like this a little bit. To fix this, I'm going to adjust the mortise of the mounting plate so it's angled, and hopefully that will bring that side up. This side is actually just a little bit tight as it comes around and towards the back, so with that I can actually just clean up the drawer with a block plane. This one I'm more concerned about. Okay, so I definitely had a little bit of spring back, deflection, shrinkage, whatever you want to call it with this shelf. You can see it doesn't fit in the form like it did when it was first glued up. And the reason for that is after I steamed it and pre-bent it in the form, I didn't give it adequate time to dry, release that moisture from the steaming, and reacclimate to the environment because I was in a rush. So just a cautionary word, if you decide to do something like this, the best plan of action is if you're going to steam it and pre-bend, is separate all the pieces after you pull it out of the form, let them all dry, and then glue it up. Now, since this is a prototype, I'm not really that concerned, but it's a great reminder that you really can't rush through this. Every step of the process needs to be respected and followed as close as you can to yield the best results. Okay, now we can fix these drawers. As I mentioned, the one on the left needed just a few shavings off with the block plane so it wasn't rubbing on the shelf itself. That only took a couple of minutes. Just a little tip here, and I try to do this whenever I'm building drawers that I know will have to be fitted, is having the grain go in the same direction all the way around the box. That way you can run a plane all the way around and won't get any tear out. If the sides have the grain going in the opposite direction as the front and the back, it makes it a little more tricky. Now I could do a little test fit and see how I did. That swings nice and free. Now for the more troublesome one, I'm actually using a router plane to create a tapered mortise. That way the mounting plate will sit in there at an angle and that should bring that right side of the drawer up and level with the top of the shelf. Wow, that is so much better. Okay, still hanging a bit low. I'm gonna do another move and then uh, I'll come back when it's fixed. All right, it's hard to see, but the gap is even now all the way around. Now the gap is a little bit bigger than the other side, but I can fix the other side to match. Just take the block plane all the way around. I needed to come up with an easy and functional solution that would create a positive stop for the pivoting drawers and keep them firmly in place when in the closed position. To do this, I channeled my inner Ramon Valdez and turned to rare earth magnets. Now magnets have enough power to be drawn to each other even when they won't touch. So my idea was to recess a magnet in the corner of each drawer in a corresponding magnet embedded in the underside of the shelf. The vertical alignment of these magnets needed to be perfect though or the drawer could close a little askew and tweak my reveals. So if it didn't work as envisioned, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. But we'll get to that in a bit. I did have one other thing to fabricate, and that were these little teeny plugs that would cover the access hole for the Allen key on the underside of the drawers. I'm not going to push that all the way in because I may not be able to get it out. Then it was on to finishing the shelf and the rest of the drawer boxes. Now I am using the LED coating on this again. I mixed up a little color that was more like a brown walnut just to kind of steer away from that golden look. Now if you're looking for more information on these LED coatings, I highly suggest you check out my buddy Suman's video that he put out on his YouTube channel, Woodcrafts by Suman. I'll put a link in the description below, as well as LED coating solutions where you can purchase the coating and the lights. I'll put a link to their YouTube channel and website as well. So you're probably wondering what my initial impressions of this coating are. Now, since I don't have a lot of experience with it, and this is my first project using it, it would be unfair to give a thorough review. 
However, it is a bit more nuancy than the traditional hard wax oils I use like Rubio Monocoat and Osmo. With those products, you're wiping off all the excess till it's dry to the touch, so it's pretty easy to get a consistent finish everywhere with no fingerprints. With this coating, you really need to work each side or each edge very carefully, because if you get any fingerprints on the wet coating and then you cure it, well, your fingerprint is in there. And the police will pick you up in about 10 minutes. You also need to make sure your coating or your applicator aren't in the drying zone as you run the light across your workpiece. Because if the light hits it, well, it will cure. However, that is obviously the huge advantage of this coating. You can put it on and cure it in two seconds and move on to the next step. Unlike traditional hard wax oils where they take anywhere from four to seven days to fully cure. With this, you can put multiple coats on in one day very quickly. And with those aforementioned multiple coats applied in the same day, I could move on to installing all the hardware. Now you may have noticed there a little piece of purple paper. Well, I did have to shim up this mounting plate just a little bit. I used a purple post-it in honor of Suman, who loves his purple accent lighting. The mounting plates installed, I could install the drawers themselves. Now about midway through this project, I realized that I hadn't come up with a hanging solution to hang this whole unit on the wall. And yes, halfway through a project is a really bad time to start thinking how you will hang a hanging shelf on the wall. So I decided to KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. A couple of figure eight fasteners spaced 32 inches apart so I can grab two studs and that should be more than sufficient. And I did not recess them into the back of the shelf, which gave me a little standoff from the wall in case it was wavy or uneven. And the great thing about these little figure eights is they're completely hidden behind the drawers. On future iterations of this project, I will come up with a more elegant solution. Oh, that's nice. 